Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson sues CNN for $50 million. The presidential campaign returned to North Carolina as we analyze new polling data from the Carolina Journal. This is Stateline. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC. Welcome to State Lines. I'm Kelly McCullen. Joining me today, good friends and even better analysts, public relations consultant Pat Ryan, Representative Brandon Lofton of Mecklenburg County made the long drive to the Triangle to be in studio. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sky David of New Frame Inc. is here debuting on State Lines. Welcome to our luxurious set and the accommodations. Thank you. Glad to be here. It's good to have you here. A great week. Great topics. We'll start with Pat because I want to focus on the Carolina Journal releasing its new statewide poll of 600 likely voters. They made the calls between October 12th and October 14th. This poll for this week carries a 4% margin of error. Those are the ground rules. Let's look at the race at the top of the ticket. Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are still essentially tied. Those are rounded off numbers. It's a half a percentage point separating Trump from Harris, 47 to 46%. And then the other high profile race, maybe even higher profile than Trump, Harris, Pat, Josh Stein, 49.3%, 35.8% for Mr. Robinson. Robinson has lost three and a half percentage points, while Stein has gained a similar percentage since September's poll. Let's hold it right there. That big story got all CNN's attention. Dominated politics, put North Carolina on the map, made Saturday Night Live. It cost him three and a half points. Not 30 points, not, you know. So what do you make of that? Yeah, look, so North Carolina is defined as a purple state, but that doesn't mean that there's a whole bunch of just moderate voters here who flip sides. There's a very strong contingent of people who vote Republican, no matter what, every election, same thing, people who vote Democrat, no matter what, every election, and there's a tiny group in the middle that at the margins decides who's going to win. So, you know, I, I think that poll might suggest to you that there are 35% of people who will vote for Mark Robinson and, and Donald Trump and other Republicans, no matter what they hear or read in the newspaper. Representative Lofton, what do, you, what do you make of the what do you make of this? The Trump Harris race stays within one point. It seems to have always been one point, and then all the movement, but only three and a half points between Stein and Robinson, pushing Stein towards fifty percent approval. Though, yeah, I think um, it's not a surprise that it's close. I mean, we expect that. We've seen statewide races the last few years; they've all been within a few percentage points. Most famously, of course, uh, Chief Justice Beasley lost her race by four hundred and one votes. So, I think the bottom line is that uh, Josh Stein has. A record and a temperament that resonates well with North Carolinians, I think, but I think it's going to be close. What is it about Stein that would appeal to Republicans from your Democratic yes. perspective? Well, I can tell you from my perspective, um, representing the kind of district that I do, a district that traditionally has been held by a Republican representative. I'm the first Democrat to hold that um, that that position in that district. Um, People want people who are serious about uh, solving problems in our state and forward-looking and thoughtful leaders, and I think that's exactly who Josh Stein is. Sky, Mark Robinson has not given up. He doubled down. He hit the campaign trail. Not much money left, not much staff left, but he's prevalent with photography and tweets and giving speeches, among other things we'll talk about later in this show, particularly that lawsuit. What do you make of this race? It's, what, 14, 15 points out. People say it's going to tighten. What do you think? I think it is going to tighten. Like Pat said, we're a purple state. It's always been close in the governor's race. It's going to be close again this year. What I was really interested in with that poll was looking at whether or not he was going to drag down other Republicans. And it seems like he's not going to do that. And I think that's pretty surprising. Yeah, I think there'll be some, uh, if, if a bunch of Republican Council of State candidates lose by a handful of uh, 1% or 2%, um, whether it's fair or not or accurate or not, I think that that narrative will present itself at that point. It'll be, well, why do they lose? Well, they lost because of Mark Robinson. It may be true, may not be true, but that's likely to be the narrative the next day if that's what ends up happening. Representative, let's look down ballot from that point. To the voters not punishing other Republicans in this case if they're going to punish Mark Robinson or benefit Josh Stein. Does that say, what does that say about the voter in North Carolina circa 2024? Or is this possibly a positive effect of having media 24-7 and social media, that voters are better informed 
and are not going to be so easily, I won't say tricked, but persuaded to punish innocent parties? Well, I think it just depends. I think we still don't know if, if that's going to have a drag on the, on the downward um, races. I do think that um, you see some candidates working to distance themselves from Mark Robinson for that point. I think Donald Trump uh, and his campaign, they recognize that he's a potential drag on the, on the down ballot races as well. Um, so I think we just don't know yet if that's going to have that, that impact. Um, but the bottom line is Mark Robinson is not the only extreme candidate that's on the ballot right now. And I think that voters, um, at least in districts that I represent, um, districts like the ones I represent, um, are put off by that kind of, that kind of leadership. Scott, what does it do to the electorate when you have Democrats, Republicans? I mean, they really, they, they hunker down when their candidate finds themselves in controversy, real or perceived. Uh, what do you make of all that? Because it did. It only moved three and a half percent. And I bet North Carolina got a billion dollars worth of free media just off of what supposedly was posted on the Internet. Yeah, I think that we're in a hyper-partisan time and people are going to stick with their team. At the end of the day, they're going to come home to their team. They're going to vote or maybe just skip that race and then vote rest Republicans. But I think it, it is interesting because I think the average North Carolinian probably did not read that story. They may have seen a headline, but they probably didn't read it. Yeah. Can I add one thing? Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that Mark Robinson um, has, there's already, voters have already been pretty well informed on just how extreme Mark Robinson is before the scandal broke. Um, you know, there have been ads, um, you know, radio, TV, digital, with his words and the things that he's, positions he's taken. So voters already knew who Mark Robinson was. Um, so Josh Stein was ahead in the polls before uh, this story broke. This just essentially affirms what, or, you know, what people know about Mark Robinson if you're not you know, if inclined to vote for Mark Robinson. Yeah, I mean, Stein was up, I think he was the first candidate up on TV with ads in North Carolina. It's been months, and um, yeah, I think he's been, the, the strategy has been replaying Mark Robinson's, uh, you might call them greatest hits or most controversial things that he said. And yeah, I look at the polls, it's clearly been, I think, an effective strategy. Um, but I think part of this is also uh, sort of part and parcel with, I think mean, Gallup came out with a poll this week. They do it every year about declining trust in, in all institutions, media, um, you know, any part of American life that maybe back in the 70s or 80s when people were ticket splitting and they were you know, not so entrenched in their tribes, um, that's not really the case anymore. And so I think part of it, you have to look at this in the context of people don't really believe what they read. And a lot of people don't believe what they read in the paper anymore. And they don't believe what they're told from, you know, X, Y, or Z previously trusted institution. And so that also, I think, creates a, you know, I'm, I'm, in, my, I'm in my group here and I don't care what you say, I'm going to be voting for that person no matter what, because I just don't trust anybody else. You think politicians are more trusted than the media now? Your average beat reporter is now less trustworthy than the politician who blames the news reporter for reporting sometimes even the facts. So the Gallup poll had um, media, and that's not, to, I, I think there's a separation between state and local media um, and just national media writ large, but the general category of media was at the bottom of the list with 31% of people most uh, trusting a lot or, or a fair amount, and that was below Congress, which I think was at something like 34 or 35%. That was surprising. I was surprised by that. Let's look down ballot just a bit more. Democrat Rachel Hunt, this is the lieutenant governor's race. It's a close race. Rachel Hunt is leading Republican Hal Weatherman. 43 to 41% practically. Hal Weatherman's been in every state in this county. Rachel Hunt is former Governor Jim Hunt's daughter. So name recognition versus hustle in the streets, right? Their representative. Jeff Jackson leads Dan Bishop, 46 to 43%. That is within the margin of error. And let's look at the superintendent's race. Mo Green leads Michelle Morrow by two and a half points for state superintendent. So voters are dialing in Representative Lofton, and it's close. No matter what you want to say about how you describe a particular candidate, we don't know who's in the lead in some of these tight races. That's right. I think it goes back to what we've been talking about, which is that North Carolina is its a purple state. Um, it's always going to be close. I think we have, and just fact check me on this if I'm wrong, but I think unaffiliated voters... It's essentially a third, a third, a third between Democrats, Republicans, and unaffiliated voters. I think that tells us everything we need to know about the kind of context we're running in statewide. Sky, had the down ballot races faded away with, with Vance and Trump and Walls and Harris here so much in North Carolina and then the Robinson-Stein campaigns, there was some concern that voters might not look that far down ballot. And then there was not a worry because these are all high-profile races. How is this playing out? 
I think it's a presidential year, so that is going to really determine who people are voting for at the local level. However, we know that a lot of money came in this week to Democratic races, and so if those candidates are going to be able to get on TV, that'll make a big difference in the coming days. All right, Hal, you've been in the, uh, Hal, Pat, you're not running for office. <laughs> Pat, how Weatherman down two points working the street. What do you make yep. of these races? Two points there. Jeff Jackson up three on Bishop Mo yep. Green by two and a half over Morrow in this poll. Which one surprises you? I, I think all of these are true coin flips. I looked back um, at the October 2020 poll from uh, Carolina Journal and Signal. Um, and as I recall, uh, Cooper was up 10 in that poll, ended up winning by four and a half. Robinson was down three in that poll, ended up winning by three. Newby was down nine and ended up winning by, of course, I think 401 votes. That's not to say that Carolina Journal's polling is wrong or you shouldn't discount this or that number. It's just to say polling is by nature a sort of in the ballpark uh, number and there's still two and a half weeks left. And it's anybody who sits here and says that, you know, Jackson is really ahead or, you know, uh, Weatherman is really behind. It's it, it, all these races are just to me complete coin flips. Admittedly, this is fun. Now, let's look at some other races before we move on to other topics. Elaine Marshall's holding a slight lead over Chad Brown in that Secretary of State race, 45 to 43 uh, percent. Brad Briner is leading Wesley Harris for treasurer. That's another Republican in the lead sky. And for Agriculture Commissioner, Steve Troxler is uh, always been a popular candidate. Republican lead Sarah Tabor by over six points and in many ways representative or it he may be the most popular uh, vote in north carolina short of elaine marshall roy cooper's off the ballot so we can't put him in that boat too why do some candidates transcend partisanship i think sometimes it's the nature of the office um, and the office you're serving in and sometimes a candidate if you've been there a while if you have an established brand um, but I think, look, that race is very competitive. I think, you know, the candidate's working very, very hard. And I think, like all these races, you'll just have to wait to see see how it turns out. Sky, I've interviewed every, almost every council of state member. Mr. Robinson never took up our invitation for an interview. But I'll tell you, I think they all are working hard. It does seem they all mean very well. And they all make the trips and, and do the miles. So what do you think candidates, what do you make of these candidates that pick long-term incumbents to go after, knowing the past performance has just been terrific, whether it's Elaine Marshall's a Democrat or Steve Troxler's Republican, even Roy Cooper back when he was running. I think anybody who decides to throw their name in the ring should be commended because it is tough, particularly running a statewide campaign against a long-serving incumbent is going to be really, really tough. But I think, particularly with Sarah Tabor, she's been doing a great job getting her name out mm -hmm. and name ID is a little bit higher than I would have expected for her. I think that those candidates are doing a fairly great job. Right, and throw the graphic up for Mike Causey. This insurance commissioner race, Pat, I want to touch on this because insurance is a big deal right now and they're not talking about it. There's a big public hearing underway about a possible 100% insurance hike in the coast and 42% statewide. Yep. But, but you saw there, Mike Causey leads Natasha Marcus. So once again, is it just coin flip stuff at this point or is are people looking at how he's handling this hearing and it may influence early voting up to election day? Uh, I, <laughs> to me, it's just it's just noise in the polls. Some people are up two points, some are down two points. I, I have a hard time believing, I could be wrong, I have a hard time believing that with so many races, and there's 10 just statewide Council of State races, that people are, are really identifying the, the insurance commissioner's role in having public hearings about rate hikes that might come about next year. It's just, it's so complicated. I just have a hard time believing that's, that's what's causing that. And undecideds are dropping. We're no longer, I don't see, if, it, if it's 45, 43, it means 88% are on board with the candidate. We don't have this 25 and 30% undecideds right now. So. That's true. Yeah. In the, in the last days of a campaign, people come home. You know, you may have Republicans who are a little uncertain, but at the end of the day, they usually come back to their party. All right, Sky, you get to kick off this one. Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson's filed that $50 million defamation suit against CNN, as well as a store clerk who released a song about Mr. Robinson back in September. We're going to focus on the CNN part of this. Mr. Robinson's attorney says Robinson's personal information, that includes email addresses, logins, passwords that were used on a porn site, were also available on the dark web way before, and that from breaches and leaks and such. Attorney Jesse Benal says, anyone could have purchased that data sky to create fake accounts in Mark Robinson's name. The Robinson camp claims both defamation and that this is a case of election interference by CNN. Here, check this out from J.D. Today, uh, we are taking the first step to do exactly what I said I was going to do after these scurrilous attacks were launched against myself and my family. We are holding CNN accountable. 
We expect to find that there are more bad actors that have been involved in this process to interfere with the election, and there is more to come. And let me say this. There have been those that have tried to interfere with our investigation by stonewalling. And to them, I will say that we will use every tool at our disposal now that a lawsuit has been filed, including the subpoena power, in order to continue pursuing the facts. And you will not be able to hide behind stonewalling. We will get to the truth. Sky. Republican leaders, Tom Tillis said, Mr. Robinson needs to sue, try to clear his name or get out of the race, put up or shut up. So Robinson's put up with a well-known attorney. Yeah, this is an interesting strategy from a couple different perspectives. One is that the story kind of faded when the hurricane hit Western North Carolina. And I thought the Lieutenant Governor did a fairly good job of being out in Western North Carolina, being there helping folks. So to bring this story back up kind of feels like he picked at the scab again to me. But I did read the defamation lawsuit and um, there are a lot of interesting claims in that lawsuit. However, unlikely to win. Was it good reading? There's a big, thick lawsuit, lots of allegations in it. Is there a case? I, mean, I guess you're an attorney. Is there a case here or is it worth a shot to explore the truth of how CNN obtained information and disseminated it? True or false with the information? I mean, sure, you can explore the truth. CNN went to painstakingly far ways to try to figure out and show the reader how they figured out that this was indeed Mark Robinson. So I think it's interesting that they're saying this was off the dark web or somebody made this up to try to put him in a position because this was so long ago, he was not a public figure. Why would somebody have been doing that decades ago? Yeah, there wasn't, uh, you know, look, I'm a Republican, you know, I might catch some flack for this, but I think that the general sentiment among some circles is great, he, he put up because he had to, you know, it's been three or four weeks now, but he did file a lawsuit. But in terms of, of like legal, the, the typical evidence you would see in a, a defamation uh, lawsuit that would indicate why you believe or why you're arguing this was totally false and untrue, um, that sort of detail wasn't there. At least that's, that's my understanding. That's correct. It's a total slap suit. And so that is a lawsuit that's brought against someone to shut them up. And it's not because you think you're going to win. That's because you want the media outlet or a person to stop talking about you because they're going to have to pay for legal fees, an attorney to try to stop this lawsuit. And it's easier for them to just settle. It's easier for CNN to just settle and be done with this versus fighting it out over years in court. Representative Lofton, we know you're on pro Stein. We've analyzed that earlier. So set this aside and say candidates who are threatening lawsuits for defamation and for slander and such in the middle of a campaign. is We've seen this a little bit more and more as we go along. You said something I don't like. We don't know if it's true or not. We're just going to sue everybody and try to shut it up. So I, I want to distinguish between, you know, filing a lawsuit because someone actually is saying things that are false about you um, or misrepresenting your record. Um, I think all of us who are candidates have had things said against us that at least approached the line. Um, and so I think it's perfectly fine to send a lawsuit to say, look, this was over the line. This is not factually based. I need you to stop because you're uh, misinforming voters. Um, this situation, I don't know if if, if Mr. Robinson feels like this falls in that category, then that's fine, but it's not going to take away from the fact that, as we discussed earlier, voters pretty much already know who Mr. Robinson is and that he's out of step with North Carolina. And you have seen, I mean, you've seen, I guess that depends on how you define success, but defamation suits in political campaigns that have resulted in, in behavior changes or uh, an example of, of uh, Cooper, when he was AG, uh, there was an, a settlement and an apology. Um, you know, Josh Stein uh, was actually, I think, investigated by the Wake County DA, and that had to go into federal court, and this whole sort of long, drawn-out controversy. Um, so there are instances in fairly recent uh, politics in North Carolina of campaigns actually having to take action because they, they said something that, that, that might have been defamatory. All right, well, let's, let's elevate to the top of the ticket where the presidential campaigns return to North Carolina this week. Heavy hitters were in our state. Former President Bill Clinton and vice presidential candidate 
Tim Walz, Fayetteville and Raleigh tour stops. Republican vice presidential nominee J.D. Vance rallied in Wilmington where he was asked if the Trump ticket still supports Republican gubernatorial nominee Mark Robinson. I think Mark Robinson did a hell of a job with those hurricanes getting out there and helping people. I thought that was very admirable. And I and I and I really appreciate that. But look, my 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 view on this issue is that who the North Carolina voters make their next governor is up to the people of North Carolina. What I'm what what I'm here to do is to persuade them that they need to make Donald Trump their next president, and I think that's what they're gonna do. Well, there you have it. North Carolina voters should settle their business inside this state. But here comes Arkansas's former governor and U.S. President Clinton. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz is here. As the Democrat, what does it mean to have Bill Clinton touring with you around Raleigh and Fayetteville? He was a popular president, even among Republicans. Yeah, I think it's definitely, it's, well, look, it signals the importance of North Carolina in this race and what we've been talking about, the theme of the show, that it's, it's just going to come down to a few percentage points. So it's kind of an all-hands-on-deck moment. I can tell you right now from going out knocking on doors, going at different events, the energy level is very high. People are fired up. They're ready to uh, bring about change, and they're ready to vote for Kamala Harris. So we're excited. Sky, how delicate is the campaign dance now with Western North Carolina now drying out, but still awfully muddy and dirty and needing to clean up? And you have high-profile candidates touring where it wasn't damaged. Is, is Do candidates have to be careful here? I think they do because... The average North Carolinian that lives out in Western North Carolina does not, this isn't their top priority voting in the election. Sure, maybe they find they want to have their civic duty and go vote, that's great. But I don't think somebody whose house and life has been ruined is thinking, oh my goodness, I've got to go get out and vote. Pat, uh, Clinton's in, Vance is down in Wilmington again. They like rallying in Wilmington. What is it down there? that makes it such a popular hotbed for Republican presidential candidates. <laughs> well, yeah, you're close to the water. It's uh, fun. Good bars and restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, yeah, Wilmington's great. Better there than here. But having Vance here instead of Trump, is it a different tone when you see them at the rallies there? Or is it the same thing to voters and they're preaching to their prospective choirs? Uh, I think that um, Vance is not as much of a draw as, as uh, Trump, obviously, but... I think he's he has a, a sort of certain um, uh, factor to him that that draws some of the uh, the, the, the more loyal Republicans to, to really want to go out and seek him out and see him as well. I think he's a, sort of an underrated draw in that sense. Is re is repeatedly asking J.D. Vance, representative, about Mark Robinson? Is uh, we've heard him answer this question two or three times. He says it's the state's business. What is the right answer there? A reporter tries to pin him down on a state campaign. And he goes, it's state's business, which is it worth nationalizing at this point? Look, I, I think it's just, I can't speak for what J.D. Vance should say in response to, to that question, but I, I can tell you um, what I'm hearing and what I think most North Carolina voters know, which is that Mark Robinson is too extreme for North Carolina and we need uh, Josh Stein as our next governor. What do you make of the rallies doing the one-on-one -on -one personal touch tour, Sky? Bill Clinton and Tim Walls walking in McDonald's. There was some, maybe, I, I think that was in North Carolina. Maybe it wasn't. But they were touring versus the large rally with a lot of energy. Uh, what do you make of those styles of campaigning across our state? I think that's smart. It's clippable. It's relatable. You're going to see it on the Internet and think, oh, I could go get a beer with that guy who went into a McDonald's and worked. I think it helps with that mix of big rally versus small town touch. All right. Pat, FEMA officials are taking things a bit cautiously in Western North Carolina this week. Um, as reports, there are reports that threats are being made against them. One person was arrested. He was considered a, quote, lone wolf, if you will, for threatening FEMA staff. But the rumors out there are more rampant, Pat. FEMA temporarily stopped house-to-house -house checks earlier this week, but work has resumed. Now, over the weekend, out of an abundance of caution, we made operational changes to keep FEMA personnel safe. But none of the changes we made impacted ongoing search and rescue or other life safety operations. We started to resume canvassing operations yesterday, and I was in the field with them, going door to door. And our disaster survivor assistance teams will continue to go door to door in impacted communities. So let me be clear. We are not going anywhere. And Pat, they certainly didn't go anywhere. I, this is social media. I've so appreciated people who have taken their cameras and filmed because it is part of history. But in a deluge of information, there's going to be all sorts of points of view about FEMA response. And 
one person at least may or may not have thought something about FEMA that caused them to be arrested. <laughs> yeah, I think you look at this in the general context of there is, there is a case to be made that uh, certain rhetoric indirectly inspires probably pretty crazy people to do extreme things. Uh, you had The last time this argument came up was with the Trump assassination attempt. I get that argument. I get why people draw these connections. I don't really buy it. I don't think it's reasonable to say that because you were trying to make a point in maybe a, a pretty severe way, but still just trying to make a general point about either FEMA recovery or your perspective on uh, former President Trump's policies, that that means you helped inspire some sort of awful event. I just don't, I don't really buy that. That's the old video game argument. Video games cause violence. Are we, are we back to this speech issue again over just there are people out there that want to watch the world burn? Yeah, I mean, I don't know where to uh, draw the line, but I do think it is important in this emergency response situation to make sure that people have accurate information. And if you're putting out false information or promoting different um, pieces of misinformation, conspiracy theories that could be dangerous. It's, you're talking about an emergency response, um, people, life and death situation for people, and we need to make sure we're not doing anything that infringes upon our responders. All right, Sky, I got 10 seconds left. Social media still, still safe bastion of information, or should we be wary? Very quickly. I'm someone who reads social media every day, and still I'm confused. I don't know what's happening, so I don't know. Well, I do know this was a great show, Pat. Brandon Sky, thank you so much. Thank you for watching. Email me statelines at pbsnc.org. I'm Kelly McCullen. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting PBSNC.